Hello! Welcome to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 73, according to my docket. Look, I've got a docket. I've got an actual list of things I want to speak about. Crazy, isn't it, nah? I'm turning professional, brothers and sisters. How are you all doing, man? How are you? Jesus Christos, Jesus Christos. It is the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 73, with me, your host, Agostino. And I hope you guys are doing well, man. I'm doing amazing. As you can see... I just came back from the barbers, had myself a little fresh trim, which I don't usually get, right? I'm not usually a big fresh trim guy, um, just because I'm lazy, man, you know? Um, being a guy and going to the barber shop is just like, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, if it's not a full day job, it's a half a day job. And when I mean that, not, not to over exaggerate, which I tend to do, which I tend to, you know, do sometimes. But you have to think about where you want to go. You have to work out the right plan of action. You know, whether you should take an Uber or you take a train, take a bus. You have to maybe um, mentally prepare yourself that you're going to wait a few hours. Or maybe you're going to wait 45 minutes. Or maybe you might be lucky and you might just walk straight in. And your guy or your girl that cuts your hair might be available and, and you get to sit down straight away. You've got to factor in the fact that um, you need to maybe carry some cash with you, right? Because most barbershops don't uh, accept card payments. Which I probably would, I probably would assume, you know, part of the tip thing and um, most barber shops or most barbers being uh, quote unquote independent cor- contractors. You might want to fudge the tax. I don't know what it is, but I don't think I've ever been to a barber shop that isn't a salon, right? I'm not talking about salons, right? I'm not talking about these um, these salons where mostly Caucasians go because, you know, you can get you can get a glass of champagne there. You know, you can print out a boarding pass if you're late to go to the airport. Um, you could probably use their toilets, you know, which um have a tendency to work and they have uh toilet paper in there too the good kind of toilet paper not the toilet paper you should get at the sunday league changing rooms you know that's my barber shop toilets i'm used to so you get all those added extras but for the most part you don't get that in a normal men barber shop right uh the stereotypical you know the barber shops where guys are always chatting shit uh the barbers taking like two or three fag breaks and a few lunch breaks whenever they feel fit and obviously you can't complain because you need the trim right you need a haircut you can't say nothing to them what can you say or what are you going to say that's going to uh, speed up the process? Probably nothing. So it's always a bit of a, um, it's always a bit of an exercise. But lately, I've been a bit lucky, right? I've been a bit lucky and I've um, suddenly, I have, or not suddenly, but uh, on my travels along the social media highway, I stumbled upon this barbershop called Rocket, right? And they've got branches mostly around East North London, right? And they're, you know, they're fairly uh, hipster branch, right? It's all about beards, tattoos. Um, I forgot, what's that What's that tattoo style that guys get and you get like the swallow on your hands? Is that traditional, traditional tattoos? So that kind of vibe, right? Traditional tattoos, guys with like slick back hair, um, sort of like um, Peaky Blinders, but with tattoos, right? In 2000, no, 2018 Peaky Blinders. So maybe riding a motorbike, maybe skateboarding a, um, a longboard or some shit or a cruiser, you know? Um, kind of pin-up girl kind of style. So it's quite a cool barbershop. Sometimes if you go in there early enough or it's empty enough, they'll they'll give you some free gin. Oh, talking about um, gin or whiskey, I've got a little gin and tonic here that I happened to purchase from the old uh, Lidl's. They do this brand called Finton's, which is quite decent. But scary. I'm showing it to the camera, and if you're not watching this on YouTube, what are you doing? Get your life in order. I'm going to put a link down there below for you to see on a podcast. But I essentially got gin and tonic in a can, and it was 85 pence, right? Now, I'm no stickler for, I'm not one of these people that likes to panic about alcohol and the fact that most of us, especially in London, especially in England, especially in Western Europe, are probably, you know, addicted to alcohol or dependent on alcohol way too much than we need to be. But 85p for a tin of gin and tonic is way too cheap, man. You can get licked off that super quickly. Um, How much percentage of alcohol is it? 5% of alcohol. Fair enough, it's only a 250 millimeter can right you're not necessarily going to get yourself wasted off of one can but you buy a couple you know you've got five on you can buy quite a few so anyway back to the barbershop so i finally found this place called rocket barbershop i happened to go there before we left for madrid i think or maybe uh, someone sometime before that no maybe before into berlin actually i went and got a haircut at this place really professional the guys take ages to cut your hair which is always a good sign right um like they've really been attentive because sometimes I go to these other barbershops and they take like 20 minutes, 15 minutes to cut your hair. And it's like, mm, I'm not sure if you're really good or if you're just banging them out so you can just get as many customers as you can in your chair. Which, you know, I'm not begrudging them to doing that. But 
being a customer, you kind of want someone to take their time, you know? It's weird, though, shops, isn't it, right? You don't want someone to take their time in um, in a supermarket, right? You get angry when uh, an old lady or a family are taking out cash at cash point. I kind of saw that this morning when I went to the gym. I went for a run, actually, and I saw this... No, the other day I went to the gym, and I saw this guy running across the road, like, really quickly. And then I was wondering, why is... I don't know, I just, I just kept looking at him while he was running across the road. Then as he ran across the road really quickly, I, I realised that he was trying to get to cash point before this mum in a pram with three other kids around her. So she had a kid in a pram and three kids around her, like in a little harem, in a little in a little circle. Do you know what I mean? guard in a pram. And all the three kids were of varying ages. They looked like it anyway. And then she went straight to the cash point. So imagine how long that cash point thing is going to take. And as soon as the guy saw the woman in front of him, he was like, oh, he kind of, you know, looked up to the sky and I kind of smiled. Like that is a one long cash point, you know, because she's got a, that mum or the guardian of those kids has to first silence or get those kids you know, calm down a little bit. Then she has to dig through her bag and get her card out because some people just have a tendency to never have their thing ready before they're going to go somewhere. So whether it be at the boarding gate, right, um, or the immigration place, they never have their passport out there when they wait to get to the, the, the person at the window and then they can take out their passport or the kind of person that once, once they turn on the, at the till, they take out their card right at the last minute. And there's this tendency of people to do this thing where they only take out their card when they get to cash point. Now, that being said, maybe you're doing that because you're scared someone might, a kid's going to roll by in a motorbike and just nick your debit card, you know what I mean? And then tap, you know, I don't know, and can't let us pay as many cheeseburgers as he wants, right? Because I think it's a limit of 30 quid. But for the most part, come on, man, take out your card, be prepared. You're at cash point, man, speed up. You know, like, and also, why are you spending more than 10 minutes at cash point? My dad does that, right? He takes so long at a cash point, it's, uh, it's annoying. I remember when we were young, I used to just walk away when he went to the cash point because I felt embarrassed standing next to him, you know, because he'd want me to stand. He'd want to take 10 minutes and he'd want me to stand on guard too. Imagine how embarrassing that is, your dad taking 30 minutes and he does that thing where when he finishes your transaction, you just stand and stare at the screen and wait until the screen goes back to the, the screensaver, like the kind of like, you know, the welcome to whatever bank it is uh, before he leaves. And, and I, I, I asked him once, like, why do you do that? And he was like, oh, he doesn't want the machine to fo- to go faulty just when he leaves and then it dispenses all his money out of his account. It's like, you do know you're insured for a, a gazillion amount if that ever happens, right? It's not, there's no problem whatsoever. And if ever, if ever you've been on a holiday and you've had someone uh, skim your card, which happened to me, I've had people like skim my card or copy your card. And I remember I had one, one of we went to Bali, someone skimmed my card and bought a TV. Which is quite annoying because I don't I don't even have a TV myself. I mean I don't even have a TV, right? And this bloody idiot went out and bought themselves a nice TV, and I called my bank from Bali, and they debited it back to my account within the next within a couple of days or something. It was really quick, so there is no real harm in that. But you know, older people have these weird superstitions, and sometimes people who are really careful do have a point. You know, like all they need is one anecdotal theft in order to kind of like verify their fears, right? They'll just read a newspaper like some kid got jacked for his like Nintendo Switch and it'll be like, see, I told you. That's why I only take out my card when I get to the cash point. All right. Or, you know, or the person that hides their pin when they're at, at the front of the Sainsbury's or whatever, I mean, um, serve, when they get served at a till. So be like, hmm, I don't know. Whatever. People have the, the things that they do. So what was I talking about? Oh, Rocky Barbershop. So I finally got myself a haircut before I'm heading off to Primavera. So this, this podcast is recorded just before I leave to Primavera Festival, which I cannot wait to go to. Um, so yeah, I'm going to Primavera Festival with a few friends. It's going to be an absolute trip. Last We went last year and I'm hoping we're going to try and do this thing every year, right? Because I think I mentioned it a few times on the podcast that I don't really have a big group of friends. I don't really have a big social group. I tend to kind of keep myself to myself and maybe to be super critical of myself too. Over the years, I haven't really made an effort to keep in contact with people who are, were who I'd count as my friends, right? So now they've become people that I know, right? I won't call them their, my friends anymore because, you know, we don't really keep in contact that often, but I know these people. Um, I might bump into them here, here and there, but for the most part, I have a very small group of friends. So the small group of friends that I do have, I would love for us to do... Um, this trip to Primavera or a trip to a festival abroad every year. I'd love it. I'd love for us, this to be like our annual thing. We do every single year we go to Primavera Festival. And it's it's a fairly easy festival to do that kind of thing for because it's not as popular as a Coachella or as a Wuha or as a Love Box or any other festival that you might have heard of, right? Or even um, a Burning Man or something. So it doesn't sell out immediately. It's not like Wireless Festival that's sold out in, in like, you know, maybe the first couple of days. 
I, I'm imagining because it's in Barcelona. I imagine because the lineup is very diverse. It covers a wide ranging of in, of of, uh, of musical backgrounds. You know, you've got DJ Cos playing. You've got Haim. You've got ASAP Rocky. You've got Ty Siegel. Uh, you've got so many people. So imagine those for, those people that I mentioned already. That's quite a, a a kind of wide breadth of people, right? So maybe that's why it's not as it's not as con specialist as maybe a Coachella is. Where it's kind of got a bit of a theme. You kind of know everyone that's on the list. You know, I don't really think you go to a Coachella and ever hear a band that you haven't heard of really but there's a few bands at primavera who i haven't heard of especially some of the spanish acts and stuff so that should be fun but i'd love to turn it into an every uh, every year thing i think sometimes i don't know what happens to you but we're living in a metropolitan city in a metropolitan city as someone else said it sort of feels like everyone's here but no one knows each other right so we all live next to each other but we don't actually spend time with each other and really get to know each other right we kind of communicate primarily through social media you know someone gets married you might find out about it on facebook first like um a friend of a friend uh, passed away recently i found out about that through facebook and wouldn't find out about that any other way really so you kind of find out about these things through social media and you tend to kind of because it's easier and because it's like a one-stop shop and you can kill two birds with one stone you kind of tend to just do all your catching up and shit through social media or maybe for a text or two but it's really important too to be in the same room with people that you love or that you care about, you know, to kind of share some alone time with them, maybe to go to a neutral place where everyone's guard is down, where everyone's new, where everyone doesn't know anyone, you know, um, and to kind of maybe rekindle and relight that fire, that friendship fire. And I've always found, and I found anyway, especially the first year that we went last year, I did feel a difference in the friendship that I've had with my friends who I went with last year, I felt as if it kind of, it kind of ramped things up a little bit, you know, um, we kind of spent a lot more time speaking to each other, texting, meeting each other during the week, it kind of helped, you know, you kind of had that goal, you had you that honeymoon period after the holiday where you, you can't stop talking to each other, you know, that kind of relationship sort of thing. It might level out after a while, right, you don't see each other maybe for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but it's better than what it was before, right? Because mostly the communication I'd have with my friends would maybe be a birthday or New Year's Eve or Halloween. But now it's like, you know, we go to a primavera every year. We're going to try and go every year. We go out a few times here. We go for have some dinner. Um, so it's, it's a really good time. So I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm meeting my friends, um, hopefully, to, well, not hopefully, I'll meet my friends tomorrow morning and get that sorted. But I had to get a haircut before I leave. You know, you, you want to feel fresh, man. There's something about going to a festival, going anywhere, especially on holidays and stuff, you just want to feel your best, isn't it? So I got my hair cut and, you know, as a guy or as anyone, you like to feel at your best. So a haircut is the best way to go. And I found this place called Rocket Barbershop, which I need to get back to going on a tangent. They've got loads of branches all over London and this one's in Leighton. It's fucking amazing. There's one guy in there who specifically cuts my hair because he's, you know, he's really good with Afro ha haircuts and shit. And yeah, I'm really, really over the moon, man. So I, def I recommend you check it I'm out. Rocket Barbershop, they're really good, man. They're really professional, really quick. They've got the system where you go in and you put your name up on a chalkboard. So it's kind of like in a list. So whenever someone's finishing, they just kind of X their name off and they call you out. So no appointments, just walk in, put your name on a chalkboard. And it's also good in, t in case you want to go, you don't want to stay. You just look at the chalkboard, see if there's, if there's like 10 names. You're like, you know what, I'll come back tomorrow. Instead of like waiting around because sometimes... In normal barber shops, you don't really know who's next or who's second. You know, you have to ask a barber, and sometimes he doesn't know either because you know he's so locked in to cutting everyone's hair. But I finally got that done. I'm here, my hair's cut. I'm ready to go, and I'm actually packed too for once, right? I've actually got all my stuff all packed up, I've, and I packed and I packed this. I got this bag too, actually, for my trip. Primavera. So I'm gonna have this as well. That I'm gonna use. Yeah, for the, for those that are watch for listening through the, the um on audio on iTunes. I'm picking up a Places and Faces little messenger duffel bag thing that I'm going to use uh, during my period of various time. I filled up with my camera, loads of camera rolls, some sunglasses, you know, just you, the, the usual kind of stuff. Oh, I've actually got a film camera too I'm going to take with me because, you know, I like to take pictures. Um, It's a little Samsung 32mm film I've got in there as well. You can probably see that on the, on the video. If not, I'm going to describe it to you. It's a little um, compact camera with a 35mm film. So that should be cool. I've got a new battery in there as well. That's going to be nice. And I've got a couple rolls of film too that I've got spare just in case I bang them out, which I don't think I will because it's about, what, it's about 20, 36 shots in each. So I should not be I should be okay in terms of shots. But, you know, why not, man? Let's use them all. Oh, and I've got these as well because, you know, it's Primavera. You want to be, be fun. You want to hang out with the kids and get connected with the millennials and shit. I've got these glasses, you know, for the bands and just for the enjoyment. Cloud glasses, man. Now I look like a proper, proper 
you know, fashion-y, YouTuber-y kind of guy. I, I fucking love these, man. They probably, I probably look like an absolute weapon, right? I'm sure some of you guys are on this video looking at me now thinking, oh my God, you look like an absolute spanner, man. Oh, I look so dumb. I don't care, all right? I'm going to wear these bloody glasses and I'm going to enjoy myself. You know what? I'm actually waiting for the podcast. Rago. So yeah, then what's going on for the podcast? So yeah, so got the got my bag, everything's all packed up, in my suitcase stuff for once, and yeah, I'm ready to ready to go, man, ready to go, ready to go. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, for once, you know what I've done because I don't like looking at my laptop when I'm talking because sometimes you know you lose your eye contact with the camera. This is probably why Case Nassas wears night glasses, isn't it? Because you can always no one can tell when you do the left right. You know, sometimes when you're looking at the camera, you I don't know when you first start talking to a camera, right? I found you sometimes can divert your eyes right or left. It's similar to talking to somebody in real life, right? You don't intently stare at their eyes all the time, right? You divert your attention because, you know, it just feels a, bit, feels a bit weird. So sometimes wearing glasses when you're talking to a camera is a good idea because when your eye wanders, no one can tell. Or maybe you can because, you know, I don't know how it looks like on the video because I can't see myself. But anyway, on to more interesting things. I've printed out a docket of the stuff I'm going to talk about on the sheet of paper because it's easier to do and I won't look at my laptop. So, first things first, Amy Schumer, big times, a young comedian, Brendan Sagalow. Now, this story came out a couple of weeks ago, so I'm pretty sure some, most of you guys have heard about it or it's been covered in most places. But Amy Schumer, which I'm sure people are, know who she is, big time comedian, you know, um, Road Trip and another movie she's got out that I like the title of called um, I Think I'm, I Feel Pretty or some shit like that, right? Really big female comic, super, super star female comic, probably like um, Kevin Hart level of famous, right? So she's like kind of like... Uh, surpassed being like a regular stand-up and she's kind of gone into the realm of like uh, movie star and all that sort of stuff, right? And I'm pretty sure she's going to start producing her own stuff. Maybe I feel pretty is something that she produced herself because I can see how they're doing it in the future. But supposedly, she's uh, she's filming a new special. Uh, a comedy special is like what comedians do. It's like the sort of like their album that they drop every year usually. It's about an hour long. I'm sure you guys know what a comedy special is. We're going to explain it to you, which I just did. But anyway, she has got a comedy special coming up. And usually whenever comedians have a comedy special coming up, they want to kind of practice what they want to do. So she went to pop into this club um, with a guy called Brandon Sagler, who I'm not too familiar with. And he mentioned on um, the Legion of Skanks podcast, which you definitely check out. Legion of Skanks podcast is super, super funny. And he mentioned basically that he was performing in his headline show at this place, this club in wherever it was in America. And um, Amy Schumer rocks up and she basically pulls him off the stage right and tells him oh i need to go on because i want to practice my shit can i come on and obviously you know she's a big time hollywood celebrity this brendan sagalow guy last time i checked on his twitter and stuff he's got 1000 followers and stuff he's, he's a fairly new comic right not new so he's a fairly young comic in the game not new but you know he might, he might be around forever but he's not that well known right so he probably feels a bit intimidated and he kind of like acquiesces and lets her go on stage but then when the story gets out everyone's like oh my god what a fucking bitch right why would she do that and I was quite confused. I was like, I've said comedians do it all the time. But then when I kind of delved into the story a bit, or I heard them speaking about Legion of Skanks, I saw that it appears that Amy Schumer has finally crossed over to the realm of, like, um, uh, delusion of grandeur. You know when you start to believe your own hype and you believe your shit don't stink? Because supposedly the uh, correct practice when you're an established comedian is that um, you can sometimes, when you're an aspiring comedian, you can sometimes get this thing called you get bumped, right? So when you go and you do it perform a set in a comedy club, there'll be a list of people. So the various times they're going to play, like a set list. But if a fam more famous guy comes in, he gets priority over you. So which that means that you might get bumped. So that means he'll, get, he'll go in front of you and he might do, and you'll be unlucky if it's Dave Chappelle because he's known to do like two hour sets. But if it's someone who's established, they might get comfortable and enjoy themselves and they might go on for an hour, which will bump you to later on in the night. And then if they have an audience and you see Jerry Seinfeld and Dave Chappelle go back to back, you're not going to hang around for a little old meter on stage. You're just going to leave. So sometimes comedians can get bummed out, right? Because when a famous comedian bumps you, it means you're going to play le much later in the night. But usually it's like an unwritten rule in the comedy circles that that's just what you do, right? You kind of like uh, pay it back so that you can kind of get the same treatment later. It's kind of a little thing that they do, right? It's a little, it's one of those unwritten rules that people do in comedy, right? If the most famous comedian comes in, he's allowed to like bump you. But usually... It's uh, the club owner, booking agent that tells you you got bumped. Or you, if you're on stage, you might get lights indicating that you need to wrap it up. Or if the, com if the comedian if the comedian them themselves is uh, friendly enough and approachable enough, they might approach you in agreement and say, hey, by the way, it's all right if I go in front of you, blah, 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 blah. But Amy Schumer supposedly went on, um, was 
by the side of the stage and was telling him to kind of like, hey, psst, psst, hey, it's Amy, come on, like, get off the stage, let me, let me go on, I need to do a set, da, da, da. it's like, because he was headlining and there was no one else to tell him to come to the stage and shit, so, it was really bad, man, reading the story, hearing him speak about Legion of, Sta of Skanks, and the guy too, Brendan Sagalow, bless him, he came across a little bit, I wouldn't say cucky, but he came across a little bit, um, he didn't really defend himself that well, he kind of just cowered at it, and when I read the text afterwards about what he said, he kind of sounded super, 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 um, I don't know what what to call it, man. He just sounded like an absolute victim. He didn't really try and stand up for himself at all. So maybe you can't really blame Amy Schumer in that regard. But it was quite sad to see, you know, like a young comedian get um, absolutely trampled by a, a much famous one um, on stage like that. And I'm going to actually play a little clip so you guys can kind of hear what the actual gist of it is. Hopefully, I've got it now. Here you go. She was like, she was like, if I... If I, <laughs> I wanted it, to find you real quick. And, uh, <laughs> She's like, I looked in the dictionary, and there your picture was. She said something really weird. She goes, that's so nice. I think, you, I think you're so great, and I know neither of us will ever forget it. What? No. I have no fucking idea. How do you not hate that's her? That's like... So I guess that text thread happens after she leaves, right? So after she leaves, she texts this Brendan Sagalo guy and says, like, you know, oh, thanks so much for help, for, like, I don't know, giving me a chance to go on stage, but also kind of suns him, right? So she's kind of like... Because she knows she's kind of fucked up, and she knows... For the most part, people in the comedy circle don't really like her, right? Because there's rumors that Amy Schumer kind of steals jokes, blah, 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 blah. Um, she's kind of defended it, or people that are around her team kind of have defended it, saying that, you know, she's got loads of writers, so they might steal jokes and kind of pass it on to her, but she's not necessarily going around on YouTube and stealing comedians' jokes. Still doesn't excuse it, but, you know, whatever. So she obviously feels kind of bad, but she's doesn't... It doesn't seem she kind of feels bad about what she, she did. She kind of wants to make sure she doesn't she's kind of checking the temperature making sure also that he doesn't go around and start talking shit about her because the other really interesting thing about amy schumer which i learned from another podcast is that she supposedly pays and is really friendly is really hospitable to the writers around her she kind of picks up loads of aspiring comics and kind of really brings her in brings them into her circle and lets them write on everything she does and she treats them really really well so there's this thing where a lot of people don't like her as a person right but then she's somehow uh, shielded herself from criticism because she helped aspiring young comics and pays them handsomely. So those guys kind of defend her to the hill because, you know, she's bringing them on fucking Hollywood movie sets and shit. But there's other guys who kind of like, you know, don't know her for that and just know her for all the shitty stuff and kind of hate her. So it's hard to judge what who the real Amy Schumer is and what you should actually, you know, how what, what how you can form your opinion of someone like this. But... It's just interesting to see how she she handled this situation. And it's also interesting to see that an alpha female absolutely sunning a male, right? Because there's always the idea of, you know, the male patriarch and all this bullshit, right? But even she was a very successful woman and she absolutely sunned this guy, right? This is what um, uh, this is what you'd expect uh, Jerry Seinfeld to do to another young male comedian. But this is a woman doing it to a man, which is really, really interesting, the dynamic of it. And it's also interesting, her technique um in manipulating him and making sure he doesn't really flip out or he doesn't go around um um talking ill of her let, let, let's let the clip continue a little bit on i don't know i was so i was so caught off guard i was like what is happening i didn't i thought she was kidding i was like oh well, even when you this say is it, so it just, dry i love it, this humor it reads in an amy <laughs> i thought she was kidding I, yeah i, thought she I was love kidding. the weird juxtaposition i feel in this whole thing i love amy and you should hate her. <laughs> can, I say, can I please say this? This is fucking excellent. Maybe you should hate her. Okay, let's see. Right. That's interesting, isn't it? Maybe you should hate. Isn't imagine that? That's always weird, isn't it? When you've got there's a friend in your group who generally everyone hates, but you like. It's like, what do you see in that person, right? But you know, you always have to make your own decisions on things. And I'm more, I'm not really someone to jump on the whole like you know group think um, thing as well. Because sometimes you know, I don't know. You need to meet people and kind of make your own judgment yourself. But it's always, that's always an interesting kind of dynamic, isn't it, in a group when there's someone that someone likes when most people don't like and they keep bringing them around and shit. And you've got to kind of pretend you're okay with it. But yeah, Brendan Sagalo, um kind of fucked up here. There's more more clips of it. Let's see what it says. What does it say? What does he say here? Oh, here's an interesting part here. 
hey, it's Amy Schumer. Can I finish that pussy? <laughs> hey, let me do 10 minutes real quick. <laughs> All right, so, Dad, go, go. Oh, man, this is great. You're you gotta, fuck you gotta, you gotta push clear. the fuck out. I put a bitch. Brandon you put a bitch. bitch out. Brandon is a cock. Brandon is a cock. Brandon is a cock. Brandon is a cock. All right, ready? Go, Brandon. I'm just doing it in regular voice. Haha, ha. cucks is a new fun word that nobody's getting oh, upset about. Oh, God, I hate this so much. Just I, shut I up, hate Brendan. this so much. Shut up, you have I'm to sorry. say it. I'm sorry. I think you're great. No, what? start that over. I didn't oh, hear no, it. I hate ha, this. Ha. I didn't hear it. Haha, ha. cucks is a new fun word that nobody's getting upset at yet. <laughs> I think you're Ugh. great. And I saw your movie with 72 other women, and it was fantastic. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Shit. Man, Jesus Christ, Brendan. So obviously that clip there, that's Brendan texting back and forth with Amy Schumer. Um, she's saying he thinks he's great. And then he replies back trying to, you know, basically licking her ass saying, oh, I saw your movie, which I'm sure, which I'm sure is Girl's Trip or one of those movies with 73 other women. You know, it's like ugh. anyone that anyone that uh, anyone that describes himself as a male feminist, man, this is this is this is a fe- I mean, this is what you get yourself into. you right now. All that male feminism stuff is just. That kind of virtue signaling so you can fuck girls is just so lame, man. I, I don't know. It's so lame. I think you should just, you know, like, just die on your own sword, you know? Try and seduce the girl through your own grit and your own romance and your own uh, skills of persuasion and your own um, personality, your humor, your style of dress, your interest and shit. Die on your own sword, right? But don't um, hide behind an ideology in order to get yourself in a good grace of somebody who probably doesn't give that much of a shit about you, right? That's that's fair to say, right? Amy Schumer probably probably would step over him if he got involved in a car crash or some shit, right? Um, but yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, to see like an, a, a female just alphaing out a guy, right, in that respect. Like, she just totally sunned him. But yeah, that happened re- recently and I don't know, there's not much lessons to be learned from that because I'm assuming most people wouldn't do something like that, but I just thought it was interesting to, something to speak about. But yeah. Um, R.I.P. Brandon Sagalow's manhood, man. Bloody hell. Um, what else is on the docket here? Oh, I like this one. A lady cannot wait for half marathons to finish. Now, before I play this clip, right, I just want to um, preface this or preface, preface, preface or preface this by saying, right, there's nothing worse, right, in life than that person who's behind you or in front of you or beside you who just cannot wait. You're both waiting for something, waiting for the next person at the post office to be free, the agent or whatever, waiting for a till to open, um, waiting for someone to serve you, um, waiting for, I don't know, a cash point, waiting for tickets, whatever it may be. That person who feels as if their time is more precious than yours. Now, I'm sure they don't think that, but the way they're acting, you're acting like it, right? Chill out, wait like everyone else, or just obey the social cues, right? Those people that don't obey social cues say, no, you know what? I'm going to do things my way, different way, you know? And, 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 and they all have that walk when they're walking off. They all have that kind of walk, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that kind of, see, I don't, I don't have to wait around. What's always waiting around stuff about? Wait, chill out, take it easy. We're all waiting, right? It happens all the time. We're all waiting. That person wants to barge through or excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. No, you stay there. No, excuse me. Wait. And you know where I hate it even more? At the fucking airport. At the airport. That person that comes super late, right? I've been late before, but the person that comes super late and they're running through everything. I've been late where you're like at the the bit before you get to the gate, right? You know, sometimes in airports... If the airport's really big, like um, Stan said, right? There's a bit before you get to the gates where you can go and get some munch. It's like just after immigration. There's a bit before the the you can have some food or whatever. Sometimes I've done this twice where I've been watching a TV show that I downloaded or something, and a time has passed. I'm like, oh shit, the gates open. And obviously, um, budget airlines they really have a small window of when they keep the gates open because you know they want to pay as less um, as least money as they can for the parking or whatever spots they have. I'm assuming so, right? So. That time, those on those occasions, I run from the food court or wherever that bit is all the way to the gate. But that's not that short. That's not that long of a distance. But I've seen people running from the front of the fucking airport. So they got off the coach, an Uber, their car, whatever it means, and they're so late that they're running all the way through the airport, right? Now, in my experience, you fucked up, right? You should have, I don't know, got up earlier, left their house earlier. And, you know, most airports 
or most airlines advise that you get to an airport three hours before uh, before your scheduled time, you know, to account for any delays or whatever it may be. And and just in case, you know, the immigration queue is just like, I don't know, everyone's kind of like leaving uh, planet Earth and the queue is like miles, miles long so that you don't, you know, rush and get everyone all anxious. Because when that person comes, the anxiety level ramps up for everyone. And I'm not an anxious person, right? I, I don't I don't necessarily get um, ruffled. Or I don't need to get, uh, you know, weirded out by that kind of stuff. But every time it happens, it pisses me off, man. It pisses me off so much. It makes me so angry. Like, the... It's so self-centered, right? It's like you wanted to get an extra hour in your in your bed so that you could um come here, run past all of us, and like, oh, sorry, 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 and then they've got the fucking coerce some um innocent staff member to kind of you know get them to speedy through to going through the flipping immigration. They jump in front of you. They're all dropping stuff. They go through the, the um the scanners it beeps i have to come back again oh i forgot my my spoon in my pocket they put that back they go through again oh my god i forgot my knife in my bottom sock they go through again oh my belt they're coming back and forth they're sweating they're dripping all over the place they're frantically panicking when that happens i stay well away i just back off i just i'm not even gonna go i, I, I don't want to be in your orbit right because the, the, it's like the person that complains all the time like always moaning oh i didn't do that i can't do that oh i don't have enough money oh my job is shit i hate my manager that kind of person right you don't want to be in their orbit right because it's gonna it's, it's like a virus it, it will infect you somehow or the other right or it will just bum you out you just end up feeling shitty or you just have a bad mood the whole day so i kind of just like you know i'll give you the room man have the room go in front you can I, i'll give you two people i'll give you two spaces in front of me to go 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 but it's still annoying, right? You're like, fucking hell, man. How fucking selfish of you. So this video wound me the fuck up, man. This woman, this, there's a half marathon happening somewhere in a small town, similar to what I did when I went to Chippenham in Bristol. Lovely little village, right? Um, I'm assuming somewhere in England. And there's a half marathon happening. And usually races, half marathon in any metropolitan city or any small town, they usually have, a, they usually have an application to close some of the roads for a, for a short period of time, right? If it's a half marathon... An average time to run a half marathon uh, in a local town, they'll close the roads maybe for four to five hours, right? Which is ample enough time to finish a half marathon. Even the most slowest, even you can probably walk a half marathon quicker within five hours, right? You can walk it from start to finish. I'm pretty sure you could. So they, they give you enough. So they give, it's like five, five, let's say five hours, right? And usually it starts early. So it starts nine or 10 o'clock. I'm sorry, nine or eight, eight, eight to nine a.m. in the morning. And usually it's on a Sunday. Or Saturday sometimes, right? But usually on Sundays. So race organizers do everything within their power to ensure that everyone that lives locally in that area isn't disrupted that much, right? So they do it from the hours of nine to whatever, right? Or eight or to whatever for five hours. And they close only Pacific roads, right? For that period of time. And usually if it's a small enough town or even a big city, you'll know ahead of time that this is happening, right? Maybe in London you won't know because there's so many races happening at one time. But usually for the big ones... In the local borough newspaper or on the website or in the local community center, whatever it means, there'll be, there'll be notices or posters up saying, hey, by the way, there's a 5K happening, 10K, half marathon, marathon, blah, blah, blah. Just so you know. It happens, and usually these races happen every year because they're a good money owner for the local council. You know, they bring a lot of media to the council. If you've got, I don't know, uh, Olympic level races or really high, I mean, same professional races running in your race, it can kind of, you know, raise the profile of the race and raise the profile of the area, blah, 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 everyone wins. So there's no excuse for not knowing, right? So if you if this happens and, you're, and you happen to be driving through the city and you can't go where you need to go to, just wait. I'm sorry, wait. You're not that important. Wait the fuck, wait. Or if you're smart, talk to one of the race organizers who usually people that volunteer for these kind of things, they will know when is the right time you can maybe cross the road or when's the right time you can maybe um, slip in through a side street. They'll give, you an, they'll give you an idea, but just be patient. And this lady is anything but patient. Click it now. As if you listen to this on the, on the, on the audio, I'm going to add all this stuff on the show notes so you can check it out yourself, right? But let's go back to the beginning. Ugh. This pissed me off so much, man. So much. So let's go back to the beginning. Or oh, let's go. No, let's let's stay here. So, um, here we go. Make this full screen. So as you can see from the screen, right, this this is a race happening somewhere, um, some sort of half marathon, I'm assuming. And look at the lady there, right, in the bottom left hand scroll corner, right. There she is, right, in her car, and she's already moved a couple cones. Because there's cones all across that street, right? Blocking it. And there's probably a sign here saying that the road is closed, right? And she's still there. 
Now, let's play it. I'm already angry. Oh, it's in Plymouth. Plymouth Half Marathon. Let me play it now for you guys. bloody workshop see i think to be fair to her right when you do that kind of thing you're well aware of the social fur part that you're committing you know you're being a fucking bitch right you know that you know you know today i'm gonna be a bitch right because she's she says quite clearly i had to get to my workshop right she's got some sort of workshop some sort of tapestry shit i don't know some sort of mummy shit she's doing right so she's well aware of how this will look and how this is going to be um taken by people that are looking at her right and she just doesn't care she doesn't care she's like you know what fuck it let me do it anyway and that plain, that kind of selfishness is horrible. Imagine what our kids are like. Imagine that, that being your mum, right? Unable to kind of like just be patient. Unable to um, abide by what everyone else is doing around her, right? Like everyone's kind of respecting the idea that there's this race going on and I'm going to just wait here and be patient. And then she lies on top of it saying she's had no information, or not been given no warning or notice about where she can go, or where she can. It's like, what? And what makes it weird is because David said to her, right? Okay, cool. You get through this road, but the whole road is closed. You're not going to be able to get anywhere else. Everything is closed, right? So she's going to have to move bothers every in every corner, and it's not going to happen. I'm pretty sure they're going to have police or some sort of um, official presence further up the the, um, the further up you go in a race. And it's just like the f absolute cheek of people sometimes. It's like, God almighty, man. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, honestly, what is wrong with you? It's like... You wonder what her kind of what she was when she was younger, like as a as a teenager and stuff, like just all wrapped up in I. You know what I mean? Way, way, way inflated sense of self, man. You just need to just take it easy. But yeah, that really annoyed me, man. It really pissed me off because the last thing you need when you're running a half marathon is to kind of keep your eye open and, um, in case some hysterical woman decides to pull out of a street that's meant to be blocked because she's got a fucking knitting workshop to go to. Like, my workshop, my workshop. Relax, man. I'm sure your workshop will continue on without you. Or I'm sure that those ladies can come back next week. Or they might even know. They might. They, they probably were told, you know? Fucking hell, man. Or, may, or maybe it's a complete lie. There probably is no workshop. She's just chatting shit. She wants to go to fucking co-op and buy cheese and onion pastry or some shit. Ugh. So annoying. People, man. Human beings sometimes can be the, the absolute worst, can't they? Especially, people, especially human beings like that anyway, for the most part. Anyway, next on the docket. Kim K accused of being a toxic influence for her diet lollipops by a woman called Jamila Jamil. Now, this is a topic I don't really want to talk about too much because, you know, I don't really care. But um, I thought it was interesting because this Jamila Jamil went, woman went in on Kim K, right? She was like, you know, she's very, very angry at Kim Kardashian for promoting these diet lollipops and in case you don't know what diet lollipop is it's from the same company that make uh flat tummy tea right so they've now developed this new product some sort of lollipop that allows you to it can maybe stays off your hunger or some shit i don't know whatever it is you know it's some 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 gimmick some bullshit right now if you see it flat tummy tea um that kind of stuff waist trainers and stuff it's all gimmicks right for the most part most of the girls who they give it to on social media are already either uh, genetically quite good looking anyway or they work out a lot right so it's not like um they give it to uh, one of those fat, fat fat acceptance girls you know those girls that kind of like talk about um 
you shouldn't body shame and shout on YouTube. That's kind of like, you know, those um, plus size models. They're not giving away showing the plus size model and making her stomach flat over the period of 30 days. That, that's not happening, right? For the most part, it's girls who are already kind of fit or work out a lot. So the reaction to this was quite weird, right? Because if you're going to react this harshly to the lollipops, what are you saying to those flat tummy tea? I think they're all bullshit, but it's like, I didn't really get it for the most part, right? Um, maybe it's a, it's a kind of weird virtue signaling thing, you know, because Jamila wants to be known as like, oh my God, I can't believe she's like a bad influence on the kids. But what she said was quite weird, I thought anyway, in general, about Kim K. So the story goes, um, this is on BBC News. Again, I'll post all my links for this article I was talking about. Uh, if you listen to us on the audio, on the description, so you can check out yourself. So the article reads, Kim Kardashian West has been called a toxic influence for posting an advert promoting a dieting lollipop. The reality TV star shared a photo of herself eating the product, which is claimed to suppress your appetite on, into, onto Instagram. Now, it's, now that, that line there, right? You shouldn't really care about what it is anymore because you know that's bullshit, right? Suppressing your hunger is no way to lose weight healthy. It's no way to lose weight in a sustainable way. And it's no way to lose weight in general, right? You don't want to do that. You don't end up being bulimic because you want to uh, fit into a bikini. And if girls start doing... Im imagine if that becomes a thing, a, a, a lollipop diet. Like, what the fuck? Right? Imagine that's the thing, right? Because I remember, oh, it's so it's just so shameful. But I remember, do you remember when Dream Girls came out? The movie with Beyonce, right? Um, where she plays that singer, Dream Girls, right? Beyonce, right? Remember that movie? So this movie came out when? 2006. Wow. So long, long time ago. So in 2006, this movie came out starring the old Queen B, right? Um, and she was incredibly thin for this movie. She, she you know, she, she acted a little bit, but acting, well, you can't really talk about acting too much because she didn't act too much. But what was really impressive was how good she looked, right? She looked very, very, um, very, very slim uh, for the role. And supposedly word got out that she was supposedly having a potato, no, is it a soup diet or some shit, right? Something really weak, like soup with just no, no salt or some shit in it. Just like Probably stuff stuff that I would a fighter would would use to maybe essentially cut weight aggressively, right? As you can see here, she looks incredibly skinny, right? Uh, very very slim face, very very slim neck. Um, this picture's not loading up too well. Side of a photo. Anyway, whatever. You kind of get the drift, right? Beyonce looked very slim in Dream Girls. Anyway, there was a period of time when my mum, right, like the psycho she is, because we've got the psycho gene in all of us. She decided she also wanted to get skinny like Beyonce and started doing the same diet. Lasted yeah three days, right? And she felt like absolute shit by the end of it. Ended up gorging on the entire fridge on day four. Because, you know, it's no sustainable way to eat, to, to survive or to lose weight in general. Because your appetite will just get ramped up. And then when you do eat, you'll just eat everything. So it's not sustainable. Anyway. That's just... That, so, but imagine lollipop diet becomes a thing. People start... Girls start just eating like two or three lollipops a day. Are you hungry? No, I'm okay. Thank you. I've got my lollipop. It's like, fuck, man. Like, this vanity thing is crazy. But if you're a Kim K, if you're a, a, a social media personality, for, for, for lack of a better term, and your entire income is based on what you look like, how you fit in clothes and shit, do what you have to do, right? I don't care, especially if it's not, you're not my friend. I, I, I should care, right? I, I want you to be around longer on the earth so you uh, make people happy who are fans of you, right? You continue to make them happy for a long period of time. But if you want the quick results and you don't care, do it, innit? enjoy yourself. But I think it's a little bit, it gets a little bit annoying and a little bit self-aggrandizing for people to come out and say, oh my God, she's not a good influence on women, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's Kim Kardashian, man. If if she's get if 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 uh, your daughter has her as an influence in terms of how she should live her life, then maybe you have to look at what you're doing in your household, right? Kim K should maybe be one of your daughter's heroes, not the main hero. She should represent uh, a range of heroes that your daughter can maybe look up to and think, you know what? I want to be like Kim K and this person, and that person, and that person, right? A combination of those kind of traits and then eventually growing to be your own person. But the article continues. Ex-Radio 1 presenter Jamila Jamil, who I don't know who she is. I'm, I'm, I don't watch TV, not, not, not because I'm cool or anything, but I don't know who she is. Um, who has a campaign around body positivity, described her as a terrible, toxic influence on young girls. Can you be body positive when you're really slim? Can you? I don't know. There's a few of those plus size models around, right? Who kind of like um, campaign for, um, especially high street stores, to to price their plus size ranges the same as normal size ranges, right? Because not normal, well, they're kind of like traditional sizes. I remember watching a, a girl on YouTube say that um, clothes for fatter people are more expensive, like clothes tax, and she basically saying that 
people would say, oh, it's because you're fat, that's why. But supposedly, clothes for taller people isn't more expensive than... It's the same price, but the kind of width, kind of depth thing, whatever, affects it more. I don't know why. Maybe because there's a smaller population of really obese people who would wear clothes on a high street, maybe. That's why. And it maybe costs more to make those garments per... The per unit cost is... I don't know what it is, but I remember her talking about it. And she's kind of like a big kind of like, I don't know, body positivity activist or whatever it may be called, right? But I don't know, can you be a positive body positivity ex um, advocate when you are fairly good looking? Um, that's Jim that's Jamila here on the on the on left hand side, kind of an Asian looking lady, I'm sure. Maybe Sri Lankan or something. I don't know what she is. Um yeah, interesting. But you know, everyone's got their thing. Um so that was a So as you can see, that's the picture that she posted, Ms. Madam Kim K. And then um supposedly it says um she commented that she's terrible. So it comments. She Jamila continues on saying, maybe don't take appetite suppressors and eat enough to fuel your brain and work hard and be successful. Jamila wrote on Twitter and to have something to say about your life at the end, other than I have a flat stomach. <laughs> I think the first bit is fair enough, right? Like, cause I, I essentially said the same thing, right? Maybe you shouldn't be, um, taking appetite suppressors in order to lose weight, but there is a certain population of people out there in the world who will do anything and everything to look um, hot, right? To look appealing to whether it's the opposite sex or whether it's to just want to look good for themselves, right? They will do it. That, that's the world they live in. I think in some cases, there is this weird kind of like a... Um, there's a weird kind of... lack of respect for people who only care about their looks, right? Um, vanity is is something that we kind of celebrate, right? People kind of buy magazines, uh, featuring uh, uh, famous, good-looking people. They maybe watch a movie with famous, good-looking people. They read gossip about them online and shit. They watch them on reality TV shows. But there's a weird thing where people want to be quick to point fingers and kind of chastise uh, vain people who not not necessarily do anything else but perpetuate the idea that they're vain successful people, right? Because I don't I don't necessarily see anything wrong with Kim Kardashian and I never have or the Kardashian clan in general. I think they've been fairly honest with um in describing or putting forth who they are as people, right? They've been fairly consistent. From the sisters to the mom to the grandma to um to the stepdad in, in Caitlyn Jenner now. They've been very consistent with who they are, right? And anyone that comes in that orbit, you might be overwhelmed. You know, Lamar Odom um, is another case. Maybe Rob Kardashian, maybe one case. Uh, Kanye probably maybe would argue. It might overwhelm you. But for the most part, what you see is what you get, right? Like constant media, uh, constant appearances, constant maybe playing around with the media and tabloids and shit and leaking stuff, not leaking stuff and living your entire life in social media, right? There might be that kind of thing that happens. But you know what you're going to get with them. And they live in a world where that is their main currency. So I don't really begrudge them if that's what they sell. Like if Kim Kardashian is maybe the perfect ambassador for flat tummy tea, no? Like that, the idea that you, you would drink a tea that would help uh, suppress your appetite in order for you to like not eat as much so then you can get really skinny. I'm not really, I, I'm not surprised that she's not promoting a uh, ketogenic diet or intermittent fasting or uh, veganism or carnivorous diet or slow carb diet or CrossFit or whatever. I'm not surprised they can recommend it. I'm not surprised that it's all um, appetite uh, suppressing shit and pills or whatever it may be called. Because I've always said, right, if someone figured out a pill that worked like Xanax, right, or whatever pill it may be where you slept and woke up and you were skinny, the whole world would be on it. Even these fat acceptance girls who talk about body positivity, I love my body, all this sort of shit. If you give them a pill, like a guarantee, when they woke up, right, they'd be, I don't know, two sizes down from what they are, right? Every pill is like a two size down thing. People would be taking them by the sixes, bruv. By the fucking sixes. Are you joking? So sometimes I'm like, I get it, right? It's, they're, easy, they're an easy target, right? They're low hanging fruit. For the most part, you know, they don't really have that much else to say about things. And whenever they do kind of step out and try and be socially aware or whatever, maybe they do they do kind of put their foot in their mouth or, you know, kind of say stupid things. Whatever. For the most part, cool. But lay off Kim K, man. Lay off them. And then the other continues, it says, um, Jamila is the founder of uh, iWay social media campaign, which encourages men and women to focus on achievements other than looks and weight. 
Do you have to have an organization that does that? That is fucking crazy, bro. So she's an activist for people who need help or need encouragement to know that you don't necessarily have to be hot and way not much you know to be successful it's like what the fuck i weigh social media campaign which encourages men and women to focus on achievements other than looks and weight it's like who this is what i mean sometimes with these people right it's like or people or people like this right i get the virtual signaling around kim k but whoever's in your organization who needs your organization to let them know that there's more to life than looks and weight they have bigger issues to worry about then Kim K sticking a lollipop in her mouth and looking susceptible into her camera. Picture's fucking gorgeous, by the way. She looks amazing, right? And like her nails, well, my manicured. But they have bigger issues to worry about than Kim K, in my opinion. Wouldn't you agree? Like, is Kim K really the biggest issue they have to worry about? I don't think so, man. I think, oh, Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, I don't know. What else is saying here? La, la, la. When she spoke to Newsbeat about it in March, the Good Place actress, well, she, that's what she's in, right, said that she, she has, she's been a body positivity warrior for a long time. Warrior, activist, man, get off your high horse, yo. You're not Mother Teresa. Shit. Warrior for body positivity? No, Jamila, no, no. You don't get that right, mate. <laughs> The product Kim is advertising is from a company which is, sells diet products, including the appetite supp uh, suppressant lollipops. The company's website says the lollipops are designed to be taken when people experience food cravings. So sort of like uh, nuts or whatever, right? Um, or some fruit. But, you know, nuts and fruits are natural products that come from the ground. And those lollipops are not. Um, but there's a the disclaimer which says these statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. So they're not approved by the FDA, but they work. Hmm. Uh, um, the same company has had social media adverts banned in the UK. Really? I didn't know that. In September last year, the advertising stages agency, the ASA, uh, told the company to take down a post from Geordie Shaw, Sophie Cazell's instagram don't know who that is which advertised a tea product oh so flat tummy tea is banned in the uk i had no idea shit the asa said uh the ads health claims weren't approved by the eu regulations regul re re regulations um it also removed an advert for the same product in april 2017 from makeup blogger uh shake beauty because it wasn't clear that the instagram post was a paid promotion newsbeat has contacted flat tummy tea representative for concussion and wait i'll give uh west for comment wow but yeah you know what jamila man take chill out it's kim k she her body is her currency that is her content for the most part their family is basically you know has revolutionized the makeup and kind of like just looking good industry whatever it may be none of them will hate them they're in entirely successful if your if your people in your organization are um use it uh maybe would get the wrong message seeing Kim Kardashian having a lollipop stuck in her mouth. I think they have bigger worries to worry about than Kim K. You guys need to concentrate maybe on where they're coming from, what's happening in their homes, what's happening in their lives, um, childhood, where they work, blah, blah, and get that mended before you go over. Because it's like, maybe it's what happened to Kim, Kim Khan, Kanye West, everyone freaking out. It's like, people put way too much credence on what a celebrity says or does, isn't it? It's too, it's scary, right? It's really scary. It's like, so everyone's kind of like poo-pooing Trump because it's, you know, uh, American, what's it, what's it called? The Apprentice, a contestant being a prisoner is fucking crazy, right? Cool, it's crazy. But then when Kanye West comes out and says stuff about slavery, everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe you said that. He's a celeb, like, he's just figured out shit yesterday. It's like, it's Kim K, man. Like, she's not Googling shit or figuring out what's FDA approved. Although that being said, I do remember seeing a video of the Kardashian online seeing... Um, Rhonda Patrick was talking to the Kardashians on one episode. I thought that was fucking awesome. Dr. Rhonda Patrick has been on the Joe Rogan podcast a few times and she's amazing. She basically got me on to doing uh, intermittent fasting, which I'm going to be doing roughly. Actually, I should do that now, actually. I'm going to sign off. But yeah, um, Jesus Christ, man. Everyone, everyone chill out. Kim K is fine. But yeah, on to the next topic. What else should we talk about here on the docket? We've got the list. While they, supposed to be, while they signed to Warner Brothers, I don't really care too tough, but it's kind of funny, right, that someone who left Atlantic is now signing to their parent company. 
again another record label it does go to show that maybe i remember joe Biden talking about it but maybe it's true there is maybe a little bit of a generational there is maybe a, uh, an operational generation gap when it comes to older acts who are unable to kind of succeed outside of the label industry the label business right they don't know how to market themselves create content uh, that lives outside of a record label they kind of need that security of being on a record label getting an advance uh, having a dedicated studio to go to having a team of videographers agents managers bookers whatever they may be because i think indie is a lot different is a more difficult than what people assume it to be but i think when you're an independent who's kind of grown up on social media you kind of grown up on soundcloud you kind of figure it out yourself you know what to do right so for instance like with me in this podcast i've got like a really cheap webcam i've got a laptop and i've got this cheap microphone i got from uh, amazon so essentially i've got the exact same step up setup as uh, joe rogan right Obviously, his setup is a lot more, is leveled up than me, but it's essentially the same core materials, right? I clip my videos on YouTube too. I put out an uh, audio version of the podcast. I promote it on all social media platforms. I have a dedicated website for it, blah, 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 blah. But imagine if you were part of a network or you're part of a station and you had to leave and do your own thing. It'd be a bit difficult because when you come into a studio, a station or a network, everything is set up for you, right? I've, I've had to move a table to get like a bit of a background, clean my camera, put these glasses on, yeah, and whatever maybe I've had to do shit, right, to get it done. I printed out this docket. When you work in a studio, everything's kind of done for you. You have someone that comes in and gives you what to, what to, and kind of gives you maybe some topics you can talk about, or maybe you go back and forth with the, with the producer and figure out what's a good topic. You have kind of um, a good soundboard kind of laid out for you. You have a, a, a studio with all the equipment laid out. So basically you can come on, press record and go. Whereas, you know, if you've got like a studio, if you've got like a home studio like I have, you kind of have to do things yourself, you know, um, ad hoc. So maybe from a Wale sense, the idea of kind of and having to really graft on his own is really difficult. Because I remember Gary Vaynerchuk talking about it when it came to Will Smith and his YouTube channel, right? Because Will Smith's vlogging a lot now. And he said that took a lot of humility to him to do, he says, because, and I didn't, I didn't really uh, get it at first, but then thinking about it, I, I kind of figured out what he meant in terms of like, if you're Will Smith and you're, a mega 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 superstar right starting on youtube and becoming a youtube vlogger isn't easy you have to start from zero you have to start from no subscribers and if your stuff is shit for the most part on youtube subscribers doesn't go up right unless maybe you kind of have a viral hit that maybe you can kind of sometimes i've seen people who don't have that many subscribers land a video on reddit uh video subreddit the, the, the video subreddit on reddit and then the video go viral and their kind of subs will kind of rocket right but usually your subscriptions are usually a kind of reflection of how long you've been uh, putting videos out and also the quality of a video. Maybe they're not as good as you think they are. So for a Hollywood celebrity to go from having box office smashes and millions of people turning out to see him at the premiere and sign my boobs, sign my shoes, sign my this, sign my dad, I love you, da, 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 to going to just uploading videos on YouTube, it takes a lot of humility to kind of like, you know, I'm going to start again from ground zero. And a lot of artists don't want to do that nowadays. They don't want to just upload stuff onto SoundCloud or have their own independent deal, have their own publishing contract and have to handle all the media stuff on their own or appear on podcasts on their own. They kind of want to just go through the same old tried and true method of being on a label. But also on the flip side, if you're Wale, maybe, maybe if you're Wale, you're maybe saying, I'm as big as a star. I think I'm a big star. I think I, I should be on the same level as a Kendrick and a Cole. I just need the right infrastructure, infrastructure around me in order to get me where I need to get to. Which, you know, you can kind of agree with, kind of not, but I can see where it's coming from. But I would have really liked to have seen Wale really kind of like detach himself from the record industry, which hasn't really been nice to him, right? It was kind of, you know, dicked him around for the most part. He's kind of had loads of clashes with radio personalities and label struggles and shit. It hasn't been nice to him. So he should have a bit more of a chip on his shoulder or he should be a bit more wary to signing into another label than the regular average Joe. I would like him to kind of, pulled away from that and kind of really gone and honed in on these kind of niche you know that kind of that really eloquent um poetry rap style that he does he makes a really great uh wifey rhythms i like to call them right he's really really good at that he's got a real melodic soulful tone about him um his background's obviously very interesting very very interesting sorry um him is it memphis he's from i've got the places from um that has a really uh specific music genre that he's kind of specific that's that kind of area that you can kind of really tap into he's obviously from nigerian descent that you can kind of tap into um he obviously comes from the he comes from the same kind of class as kendrick uh drake and no ken maybe yeah kendrick drake and cole let's say for the most part so i don't know man i'm disappointed that he's signing into a label it's gonna be the same old shit 
really drama wise for him. I don't think anything's gonna change for the most part. Maybe it will. Maybe he's gonna. Maybe he's kind of coming there with his with like a uh, line, a uh, kind of run, a uh, kind of um, a catalog of stuff he wants to put out, right? And ways he wants to do it, right? He kind of maybe has loads of material. And look, here's how I want to do it. I just need you to kind of pay for it and kind of put me in the right places and kind of press the button. I need to press the button. Um, hopefully that happens. But you know, what can you do? Oh, talk about music. Should we talk about a bit about Pusha T and Drake, or should I do it for another time? Pusha T and Drake. Let's do it another time. Um, what else? On a docket. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe that might be good. Because it might be a good place to end it. Maybe it might be a good place to end it. Um, because maybe should I pack a bit more? I might have to pack some more. Actually, yeah, it might be a good place to end it in terms of talking in general. Because you know, that's just chatter and chatter and chatter away. But have you guys seen the Pusha T and Drake stuff? I'm hoping you have. If you have, then you'd know that it's 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 gone absolutely nuclear, isn't it? Pusha T just released a track on SoundCloud the other day that was absolutely devastating, right? Um, everyone kind of found out that Drake maybe has a baby mother um, out there that he's kind of keeping secret, some porn star, stripper, urban model, whatever she categorizes herself as, and a kid who's supposedly named after Drake's up-and-coming Adidas line, which is what the title of the song was called, Adonin or something, right? Maybe I should get it up here instead of talking about it. To it's, to it's, talking to it's talking about music, same as dancing to architecture? Maybe it is. Let's see. SoundCloud. Let's see. The story of Adonin, right? Uh, Drake's track had like 3 million views now or something like that, right? I wonder how one person, maybe he's got 9 or 6. Let's see. Push T's done really well, though. That new album that's come out is fucking banging. And he's kind of, you know, he's kind of waltzed into this beef and kind of come out of it looking unharmed. And maybe people have kind of. It's not really a funny position as being a very, very, very formidable opponent when it comes to rap. So I'm sure you guys have heard it, but you know, the the cover is fucking crazy. It's this picture of Drake basically in blackface, which in American culture and most cultures is like a, the, the, the absolute faux party, especially nowadays in the kind of political correct day we live in today. You can't really do that now because it represents a very painful part of black uh, uh, African-American history in America. But anyway... Enough, enough of my history lesson. Let's play a bit of this story of Adonin by Pusha T. Available now on SoundCloud. Easy money. It's about to be a surgical summer. Chop the tops off the coops. The cuatro ciento ochenta y ocho. The spider joint. know we gotta cut the heads off these snakes right black. watch the body drop drug dealing aside ghost right in the side let's have a heart to heart about your pride even though your mold's high i see that your soul don't look alive the m's count different when baby divides the pie wait let's examine why your music for the past few years been angry and full of lies i started at the home front i'm on one dennis graham stay off the gram bitch i'm on one you mentioned wedding ring like it's a bad thing your father walked away at five hell of a dad thing marriage is something that sandy never had well, as you can tell, it's fairly personal attack. And this all stems from Drake mentioning Virginia Williams right at the end. Because it didn't really make no sense, right? Drake's diss track, he kind of goes after Kanye, goes after Pusha T street credibility, goes after Pusha T personally, blah, 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 blah. And then sometime, somehow he just throws in the alley-oop out of nowhere, right? I was shot at uh, Pusha T's girl, Virginia Williams. Who a lot of people probably didn't know her name because he's kind of private with that sort of stuff. And it was like, it came out of nowhere. And supposedly Push T just wasn't having that, right? For someone he probably doesn't rate anyway in general. And he just went on a full tirade and just threw his entire family under the bus, dug up a picture that no one knew that Drake had, of Drake that no one knew was available. Just some crazy, 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 crazy shit. So now everyone's kind of on this tip where they're like, oh man, I love it. Hip hop is back to being competitive again and everyone's angry and dissing each other. I'm not really a big fan of it personally. I like diss records, I like battles, but I don't like the idea that everyone's saying rap is, rap is a competitive sport. No, it isn't. Hip hop is. Sorry, rap, rap might be, but hip hop isn't. Hip hop, the actual genre that 
He's one of the popular music genres in, I don't know, world music nowadays, maybe North America. I don't know what that statistic was that came out the other day about it, but I don't necessarily like the idea in hip hop nowadays where everyone's competing for this, this, um, this uh, imagined number one spot. It doesn't exist. This number one spot is a, is a, is a complete fabrication of the industry, right? Because the industry has their favorites, so has their their darlings of the moment, right? Drake had his run, had his moment. There was a period of time where some conspiracy theorists were saying that they wanted to, they wanted Drake to get they wanted Kendrick to get Drake out, right? So they were doing everything in their power to make to behind the scenes to engineer something that would allow Kendrick to take over Drake. Then it was they wanted Chance to take over Drake, right? Because when Chance was on his tear, being a Christian, talking about God in his raps, donating money into Chicago charities. Because, you know, you obviously can't have one person dominating for so long. You know, Beyonce, even Beyonce got it, right? Beyonce, during her run, people was like, oh, people started getting bored of Beyonce and started, you know, wanting to take a break. So there was a thing in the industry where I think in general, they're the ones that created this thing where there's a number one, there's meant to be this some sort of number one spot. The, the audience of hip-hop has kind of changed because it involves everyone. They just want to hear good music. And there's enough people out there, in my opinion, I'm, an all, I'm always going to ascribe to the theory of abundance, not scarcity, right? I think there's enough people out there, fans, for you to have your own fan base and for you to also be able to have other people's fan bases. There's enough for everyone to go around. I'm sure there is. Because if festivals are an indication of how popular a music genre is, you can't name a festival, maybe, especially a popular one, that doesn't have hip-hop act on the lineup. You can't name one. I probably You probably can't, right? There's... There has to be some representative of the hip hop culture on that lineup, and these festivals take place all over the world, right? From the west coast to the east coast of America, from north to south, from mid uh, mainland Europe to uh, parts of our shore in in Great Britain and stuff. They take place everywhere, so that means there's fans everywhere for these kind of acts. So the idea that somehow whoever wins this battle between Pusha T and Drake is gonna have to retire, give up, you're dead not really the case and you know what the weird thing is as, as big as drake and pusha t are or as big as drake is you know because pushy probably not as big as drake is in terms of popularity but as maybe as as what as um as much coverage this is getting in the media that probably the average joe the general public person probably doesn't know much about his backstory probably isn't paying that much attention to it in general that's a weird thing because it's like it matters a lot to us right because we're fans right we, we care about his artists right I really like Drake. I've been a fan of him since comeback season. I love Pusha T, you know. I was banging the table to grinding um, when I was in school, right? I fucking love that instrumental. Uh, I love when DWE did a freestyle of that one time before. Um, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, I love the clips. I love them with Neptunes. I love him. I love all of his work, right, in general. Stuff he did with good music, the Good Friday stuff was amazing. So it's not as if I'm going to stop liking any of them. They're not. I don't have a favorite. They're both. I like them both the same. They might have a particular crowd that goes after them, but for the most part, you really think Pusha T fans are going to stop listening to Pusha T if Drake murders him? And do you really think Drake fans are going to stop listening to Pusha T, uh, to Drake fan, to Drake if Pusha T ends up killing him too? I don't think so. So, I don't know, man. I, I really feel uncomfortable by this idea that pits artists against each other, you know, in this kind of uh, to-the-death brawl or something. It's so pathetic, man. It's like, let's grow up. It's a music genre now. Um... You can have your tiff, you can have your arguments, but no one's going to die after a battle. No one's going to lose fans or something. You know, it doesn't happen that way. It happens. What happens is that an artist just gets shit over time and people stop supporting their music, right? Eventually, people are going to give up and not be fans of it anymore. Or your audience, like an, uh, an Eminem, your audience just evolve, right? The people that liked Eminem's album Revival, which I absolutely hated, are not the same fans who will listen to Marshall Mathers LP or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I, I think so. I probably don't, I don't think the same person. I think his fans evolved. Maybe listen to his newer stuff, which he, you know, I'm pretty sure Eminem's like, look, I'm not going to make uh, my old stuff again. So they have a one, they have one idea of, of how they want to do things. But I don't know, man. I don't know. It's a weird, it's a weird time for hip hop. Hopefully we just hear music and doesn't necessarily get to violence, but this list, Push T's already kind of really lowered the tone of the whole ba uh, uh, battle by mentioning 40, saying that he's going to die soon, mentioning Drake's mom, mentioning Drake's dad. It's gone really, really personal. I'm not sure how far this is going to go, but I hope it doesn't go too far. hope you stick to the music. And in general, just listen to the artists you like, man. It doesn't matter what happens in a battle. And let's stop pitting artists against each other. Let's 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 celebrate the music, you know? Push T's Daytona's out now on iTunes and all the other streaming platforms, and it's fucking sick. 
so you should check that out too. Um, I quite like I'm Upset by Drake, actually. Um, I think it's quite cool. Pushy kind of takes the piss out of him being upset at the end of the track, but I kind of like I'm Upset, but I don't know, man. I'm I'm not really a fan of the whole, like, uh, pitting artists against each other in this kind of, you know, to the death battle and shit. They do all the time with female artists, all the time, right? It's, there could only be one hip rap, uh, female rap artist, uh, hip-hop artist at the time or whatever. Carly BV, Nikki, this kind of manufactured beef like just relax man like everyone can breathe you know everyone can live everyone can kind of uh live uh within within the same room even do you know what i mean like i'm a big believer like you know the iron sharpens iron you know the stronger the lineup the better we all are the better the whole the whole scene looks you know if there's a lineup full of like your best art the best artists on the scene right now that's what matters who cares about who's the best rapper for instance for the most part the backpack backpack rappers who like that kind of stuff are always going to have their their arguments and their debates and their lists they're always going to have them but the wider the wider public or music fans in general don't care and i know i don't in general i love hip-hop i love rap i watch battle rap but i honestly could not care less who wins or this and i'm not going to stop listening to one person or the other i don't care but you know the content behind it is really interesting and funny but it's also interesting to it's also interesting to see where everyone's going to fall with the drake thing because i've always long believed people don't really like drake in a scene i think a lot of people have kind of said that his, his attitude kind of stinks a little bit right you know for obvious reasons you know he probably he's been on a, a an absolute tear in the industry right like album after album platinum 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 singles all that sort of shit so he probably you know might have a bit of a big head no pun intended so it'll be interesting to see what, what, how the haters come out of the woodwork. People that actually don't like him are going like, to start coming out of the woodwork and say, you know what, you know, and start uh, giving push and T info to kind of, you know, drag Drake down in some respects. So let's see what happens. But I don't know. I'm not really a fan of the whole, like, let's kill them until they all die and shit. That's stupid. They're all artists. Let, let them live and shit. Talking about dragging, have you seen what happened to Roseanne? I haven't been, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't watch Roseanne and shit, but it's interesting to see, right? So... She tweets the other day that some some politician looks like a monkey or some shit, and then they pull a show, the reboot of the Roseanne show, from the screens, which is kind of bad, you know, obviously for her personally, but it's so selfish of Roseanne, you know, all those people that work on that program, on that set, who are counting on that money to see them through the year, or maybe to kind of set them up uh, for the next couple of years and now out of a job, it's so, so, so annoying, you know, when the star of the show takes it upon themselves to kind of, you know, be the diva. And now she came out and, and supposedly said that she was on ambient pills. That's what made her go a bit crazy and say racist stuff on Twitter. But it's like, dude, ambient pills and, I don't know, you drive up your car somewhere, you wake up, you don't know where you are, you go for a sleepwalk, you wet the bed or some shit, cool. But who pulls out their phone on, on ambient or when you're high and starts tweeting racist shit? I know when you get high off coke or you get buzzed off alcohol, you might get a little bit flirty and start texting people you shouldn't be texting, right? Or... If you're out with your friends and you've got alcohol, you might dance a little bit more uh, um, joyfully or you might be a bit more gutsy with your dance moves with a bit of booze down your neck. But I don't I necessarily heard of anyone taking any pills or anything and getting racist or getting really... Oh, actually, I take that back. Didn't John Galliano have something to do with that, right? John Galliano was supposedly blamed stress of, of the industry when he started going on some anti-Semitic anti rant outside some Paris cafe when he got a bit too drunk. Supposed to be just drunk, but there definitely was some substance involved in there. I would imagine so, allegedly. But I to remember that happened to John Galliano as well. But it was a, such a shit excuse, right? Roseanne's had a history of being this controversial, say what I want, uh, edgy comic, whatever, right? But it gets a bit old. You're 60 years old. You're someone's mum and grandma, man. Just stop being, just stop it. Relax, chill out, man. Kind of like um, hone that rage, that rage voice and kind of deliver it and be a bit more tactful with it. But she wasn't. She kind of always wanted to kind of go out there and blurt her opinion. And it finally bit her on the back, you know. And she cost everyone a job. And she's also costing, um, she also kind of, you know, a, a highly rated show that was getting some big numbers on, on ABC is off now the table. And supposedly she's coming on Joe Rogan soon, I think, in a couple of weeks. So that should be interesting to, to hear what she has to say about it, the whole thing once the dust settles. But fucking all, Roseanne, man. What a shitty thing to do. You know what I mean? Like, imagine coming to work and you hear your the lead actress of your show that you're on decided to go on a rant and course a black lady a monkey. Who does? I don't know, man. America's weird when it comes to that kind of stuff anyway in general. But hey, what can you do? I think that might be a good place to end it. Actually, the show episode number 73. I might do another one quickly before I leave as well, actually, in the night because you know, I'm a night creature. I'm a night owl or in the morning before I leave to go to Primavera Festival. I'm looking forward to that. So check me out very, very soon. For everything else concerning the old Agostino, check out my website, actionzinger.com. 
I'm going to be playing at the Heathcote and Star on June 23rd. I think that's a Saturday, so check me out there. I'll be DJing at the Heathcote and Star very, very soon. But again, to check out all the information regarding I and every other DJ appearance and blog posts and all that sort of stuff, check out exnozinga.com for your information. It's been amazing talking to you guys as per usual. It's always a pleasure, never a chore. I'm going to go ahead now and pack some more stuff because I've just remembered some stuff that I haven't packed. No, you know, it's just before they're going to leave and you start remembering everything that you missed out. Oh, I've got this, I've got that, I've got that. Ugh! So I'm going to get one of those things. I'm going to make sure I pack my converters too because I've, I've, I've got this, I've got like a box full of um, power adapters, right? Like I've, I might have got six. And you know why I have six? Because every time I go on holiday, I forget to take one with me and I have to buy one at the airport for like 17 pounds or whatever, how much they are, right? Um, it's weird because a, a, a pack of two will be like 22 and one will be like 17. Like I'm obviously going to get 17 one, but still it's like 17 pounds for a power adapter that you're only going to use three times whenever you go on holiday, right? In the year. So if you go on holiday twice, you're only going to use it twice. Shit. They must make some money in those power adapters, man. Anyway, this has been the Agus Zinger Show episode number 73. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you very, very soon. Peace.